Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fosco. Now, before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription really helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, so I was supposed to have a whole set of New Zealand episodes the past couple weeks, but due to various reasons, those will have to wait until after my New Year's Eve special. I expect them to be some killer content, however. Uh, at least the scripts are done. I have, I just have uh, a lot of extra stuff to do for them besides actually recording and editing them. Now, let's get into this week's wines, shall we? So I've got an Argentine sparkling wine and two Bordeaux wines for my Christmas special. A bit of a different combination, but that's the wines I've assembled from the free samples I received. At least on the surface, that is. As per usual, I have free reign to review them how I wish. So the Bordeaux wines are the other two from the set of four sent to me I use for, the hol for, use for holiday wines. I reviewed the other two on the Thanksgiving special. The sparkling wine from Argentina is one of two sparkling wines from the same winery. You'll see uh, next. You'll see the, you'll see that one next week along with the two sparkling wines from Italy. So let's look at the first wine. It's from a winery I'm very familiar with, Domaine Bousquet. If you've been a long-term viewer of the show, then you'll know I frequently get wines from them via my good friends at Creative Palette. I'm grateful for all the support they've given me over the years. I've covered the background for the winery in the past, so I'll give you the shorter version. Okay, that's what I wrote in the script. This version isn't going to be that short. Their roots are in Carcassonne, France. This is in southern France, and they were winemakers there. Jean Bousquet traveled to Argentina in 1990 on vacation. He visited the Guatiari Valley. This valley is in the Tupangato district of the Uco Valley, and all of this is in the Mendoza region. During this trip, he decided that he was this is where he was going to set up shop. Now, mind you, there was no viticulture at all in this area. When he informed his family about what he was going to do, they thought he was crazy. Nevertheless, he purchased several hundred acres of land. Not only that, he secured the water rights as rainfall is very low. Like, sometimes there will be no rainfall in a, for an entire year due to the rain shadow effect from the Andes Mountains. So, irrigation is critical. We are in a very high altitude area as well. There are almost... They are almost at the foot of the Andes Mountains. While we call it a valley, it's really a pretty flat area. Now, altitudes range from 4,000 to 5,000 feet or higher. I'll come, by the, I'll come back to that in a second. Now, Jean didn't only have to establish a winery. He needed to get the wells drilled, electricity to the property, roads built, etc. He was able to do all that. And then in 2002, his daughter, Anne, and her husband, Labid uh, Al-Ameri, started becoming more involved. Eventually, they bought Jean's shares of the winery and became owners uh, in 2011. They make a lot of wines, about 4 million liters or just over 1 million gallons. In terms of cases, that's over 440,000 cases. 95% of the production is exported to over 50 countries. Now, I was lucky enough to have lunch with Anne a few weeks ago while she was visiting a couple Texas cities. She was joined by Kate from Creative Palette and the rep for the wine. Now, this was a wonderful lunch and we got to talk about all sorts of things. I got more insight into the background of the winery, Anne's family, what drove her and her husband to get into this crazy industry, farming practices, and all kinds of other wine and non-wine subjects. One of the things that I found interesting in that growing up in Carcassonne, Anne wanted nothing to do with viticulture and winemaking. She was involved with it at a young age, but she didn't see herself continuing in the business. She left for the University of Toulouse to get an economics degree. She, went to, she then went to Minnesota of all places to get her master's at St. Cloud State University. This is where she met her future husband. Now, I asked her why she would move to such a cold place after coming from the south of France. She told me the brochures didn't show any snow. I mean, seriously, she's like, hey, I didn't know it was going to be that cold. Anyway, after her and her husband started careers in the business world, her father, Jean, asked if they could help. 
it started as a bit of a part-time help going to a couple trade shows in Europe like Provine, and it just exploded from there. The biggest thing about where the winery is, is that it is very easy to farm organically. They are the largest organic Argentine winery. As I mentioned, it's dry, as in a desert, that helps prevent disease and pests from attacking the vines. They are very serious about organics and have practiced it since day one. They are now getting into regenerative and sustainable practices, so I'm excited to see them continue that. Anne told me that they are the first regenerative organic certified or ROC winery in Argentina. Um, basically, there's only, there's only like five wineries in the world that have this certification. Now, the ROC is the official certification for regenerative. I covered this in my farming practices series a couple years ago, so check that out. Also, being where they're at affords them the luxury of large diagonal shifts hot days and cool nights. This helps retain acidity in the grapes. They also get a ton of sunlight hours due to the rain shadow effect. And soils are a sandy loam with calcareous incrustations along with a variety of rocks of different sizes. They also have several other certifications either for the winery or for the wines. Not every wine has every certification, but many do. You'll see them listed on their labels. Needless to say, they are serious about wine, the environment, and their employees. Okay, I guess this wasn't uh, as short as I thought it was going to be. I'll say I left out a lot of stuff, so make sure to check out the website. As far as the wine, we have not only a sparkling wine, but a traditional method wine. I may or may not have reviewed this wine in the past. If so, it's been at least a couple years, and while it's non-vintage, it's still going to have different vintages in it. Um, what I've, I'm pretty sure I did in the past was their, not their traditional method, but their Charmant method. I know I've done that one. I don't think I've done the traditional method as far as I know. Anyway, this is effectively the Argentine version of Champagne, or at least non-vintage. They are using the same grapes and methods that are used in Champagne. Traditional method means the second fermentation, the one that gives us the bubbles, happens in the bottle. The wine goes through a first fermentation. Once that's complete, then it will get uh, blended and bottled. At this point, a small amount of yeast and sugar is added to uh, the wine to cause a second fermentation to trap CO2 in the bottle, and then it will age for a, spe a specific period of time on the lees. Those are the dead yeast cells. Uh, during this time, the bottles are eventually upside down, so the lees are in the neck of the bottle. Once the aging is complete, the bottle will be disgorged and a cork will be inserted. Before inserting the cork, however, a small amount of wine that was saved from the first fermentation will be used to top off the bottle since disgorgement causes wine to escape from the pressure. They will also add uh, a, a small amount of sugar to give it its final uh, sweetness. So brute, extra brute, extra dry, do demi-sec, all that kind of stuff, okay? Now, depending on where you're making a traditional method wine, this second fermentation and aging might be regulated or not. Where it is regulated, it's usually at least 15 months, but can be a little less or longer for a non-vintage version. Vintage versions are usually 30 to 36 months minimum. Uh, in this case, it's six months. Uh, it does depend as far as the vintage stuff. It could be 24 months, but a lot of it's 30 to 36 months. Now let's get the stats for this wine. This is a non-vintage Domaine Bousquet Sparkling Brut Traditional Organic Blanco. Suggested retail price is $18. It is from Mendoza. It is 75% Chardonnay, 25% Pinot Noir. It is hand harvested, made with organic grapes, vegan friendly, certified sustainable. Uh, the lease aging is six months. The ABV is 12% and the RS is Brut or eight grams per liter. The pH is 3.05 and the TA or total acidity is 8.92. One last thing, the back label mentions gluten-free. Now, I worked up the courage to ask Anne about this at lunch, uh, as far as gluten-free. Courage? Yeah. Since I had done a bit of a five-minute rant, you could call it, on another wine of theirs, I wanted to make sure I approached this in a certain way. I essentially asked why they, why do they go through the effort, I may have said hassle, uh, to get this certification. And she honestly said because they can, and she said it wasn't a hassle. Now, my take on, on, my take on this is that we, as in the general public, have no idea how the products we consume are made. Now, I know gluten never touches a wine, and those is also. Uh, but with the continued rise of products being labeled gluten-free, there may be a portion of the public that may think wine could have gluten in it. I talk with people almost every day that have literally no clue how wine is made. 
they hear some buzzwords, and then they ask me for a wine using those same buzzwords. Gluten really never comes up, but having that certification is a way to assure someone there's none in it. I'm still not a fan of this marketing, but at least I understand it from the winery's perspective. Understand this isn't directly from Anne, just how I interpreted the few minutes we talked about it. She seemed impressed <laughs> at how much, I'd how much research I'd put into this because I wanted to be absolutely sure about that there's no gluten in wine. Just remember, all wine is gluten-free by default. Okay, let's move on to the first Bordeaux wine. Unlike the Thanksgiving special, the two Bordeaux wines are not from the same winery. This one comes from Chateau Olivier. The chateau dates back to the 11th century when it was just a keep or fortified tower or residence. This makes it one of the oldest properties in Bordeaux. Now, keeps are usually part of a castle. This is also where the fiefdom named uh, Olive in the lands of Leonium seems to first pop up from various writers. This would eventually become the current spelling of Olivier and Leonium becomes Leonian of Pesach Leonian, at least from what I can tell from their website. In the early 16th century, Arthas de Olivier, Lord of Leonion, expands the keep to a defensive chateau surrounded by four towers. Here we need to talk about the meaning of the word chateau. Its proper meaning is castle, but can also mean palace, mansion, or even manor house. In all cases, it's typically thought of as a large or very large building where the property owner or even a member of royalty resides. This is when it gets the name Chateau Olivier. This is also when the first vines are planted. Over the next couple centuries, new owners come and go, and the, the chateau's current shape appears. In the 18th century, the first winery facilities are built. The 18th century also sees Bordeaux's wine reputation uh, really accelerating. It had already enjoyed a lot of recognition during the previous few centuries for a lot of reasons, but it wasn't until the 17th century, some 1700s, where we see expansion due to its growing importance in trade. Not just wine, but other goods. The city's port became France's busiest port and the second busiest in the world after London. So lots of money was pouring into the region fueling expansion like Chateau Olivier experienced. The family who currently owns the chateau, the Bethmans, acquired it via marriage in 1867. In 1953, a group of wineries petitioned the INAO for a classification for the northern part of the Graves region. Uh, which is Pe Pesach Leonion. The INAO is the official governmental organization that controls France's appellation systems for all products. This was similar to the historical 1855 Bordeaux classification for the Medoc. 16 chateaux received the classification of Grand Cru Class A, including Chateau Olivier. Uh, Chateau Opryon has the distinction of being in both classifications. These 16 chateaux are considered the best white Bordeaux wines. If you look at the list, you'll see that some changes happened since 1953, resulting in officially 14 chateaus uh, due to some merges. Uh, with that said, there are still wines from all 16 chateaux that are still produced. The Grave classification is for both red and white wines. The 1855 classification is only for red. Saint Emilion followed with their own classification in 1955. Of the three, only Saint Emilion's gets somewhat regular updates, though not without some controversy. The Pesach Lignon region begins in the city of Bordeaux and continues to the south. As the city of Bordeaux has expanded over the past few centuries, the vineyards were replaced with urban development. You can still find vineyards surrounded by buildings, but most of the vineyards are south of the city. Given the history of this chateau, it's not surprising that it is now surrounded by the city. From what I can tell, the vineyards are to the north, while to the south you have forest land that I believe is owned by them. Uh, they possibly also own the forest land to the west. Uh, what you're seeing right now is how the INAO delimits the individual plots of land that are, official, that are the official part of an appellation. Instead of drawing an overall boundary for the appellations, the INAO designates plots of land, which is what I downloaded from them. <clears throat> Basically, the property is huge. There's also a, a small little vineyard uh, west of all the forest land that I'm, I'm almost positive is theirs. This wine is a white wine kind of already hinted to that by now. In Bordeaux, the main grapes for white are Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. Muscadel, not related in any way to Muscat, uh, and some other grapes are also allowed. Let's get a bit technical and geeky. In France, especially in Bordeaux, we will see the word 
on cepagement. This indicates what grapes are planted in the vineyard. We also have the word assemblage. This is the final blend of the wine for that vintage. It can be confusing to remember the difference between the two, especially if the winery's assemblage ends up just being the same as the ensipagement. In this case, it's pretty close. The Chateau is also level three HV or HEV in English certified. This stands for Haute Valeur Environmental or in high environmental value. I mentioned this in the Thanksgiving special as that Chateau was also a level three HVE. This is France's main sustainability certification. Level three is the highest level. So they are not just organic or at least mostly organic in the vineyard, but practice sustainability in the winery and as a business. They don't really go into detail about their sustainability in the website though. Okay, let's get the stats for this wine. The 2020 Chateau Olivier Grand Cru Class A Bordeaux Blanc suggested retail price is $35. It's from the Pesec Lignon region. The encipagement is 80% Sauvignon Blanc, 20% Semillon. The assemblage is 75% Sauvignon Blanc and 25% Semillon. The vineyard size is 60 hectares. That's the entire vineyard, not just for the grapes for this wine. The soils are 50% gravel, 35% clay limestone, and 15% sand. Uh, they're a level three HVE. They have an ISO, they are also ISO 14001 certified, and the ABV is 13%. Now the ISO 14001 is an environmental certification. It's used in conjunction with sustainability. I have a link below for that organization that certified this winery. On to the third wine. We are staying in the Pesac Leon region and a bit deeper into the city of Bordeaux itself. Chateau Pic Caillou. Now with Chateau Aubriand less than two miles as the crow flies to the southeast, and Chateau Papa Clement just over one mile to the south, Chateau Pic Caillou has some pretty impressive neighbors. The vineyards appear to have began at the end of the 18th century, and the chateau was built in 1756 by architect Jean Leclot. Uh, his son Etienne takes over, but dies in 1812. Over the next 130 years, it has various owners, and the vineyard goes into decline. In 1947, Bordeaux entrepreneur Etienne, another Etienne, Denis, buys the property. He hires a team of estate managers to, to take care of the estate and vineyard. It stays in the family with Etienne's granddaughter, Isabel, and her husband, Pauline, or Pauline Calvet, or Calvé, sorry, uh, taking ownership in 1997. Pauline took over the winemaking duties in 2006. In 2007, he hired consultant Valerie Levine uh, to assist the new crew and contribute her expertise and technical support. Like Chateau Olivier, their vineyard is based on gravel soils. They have a total of 25.75 hectares with 22.5 planted to red varieties and the remaining 3.25 hectares planted to white. Their average age of their vines is 25 years. Now their website mentions they have received HEV, HEV or HVE certification in 2018. I suspect this is level one as they do not have the logo on their bottle. They list several things they do in the vineyard. They do traditional plowing. They use mixed guyot and single guyot pruning. Uh, Deleafing on the east side of the row at the beginning of July. Uh, they do crop thinning at the beginning of August at Verasion. They uh, hand harvesting is spread out over a period of around six weeks and they harvest in small crates for the white grapes. Not sure exactly what traditional plowing is, but if I had to guess, it's done with a horse or a mule. Um, anyway, let's get the stats for this wine. The 2020 Chateau Pic Caillou Rouge. The suggested retail price is $45. It's from the Pesac Lignon region. The encipagement is 60% Cabernet Sauvignon, 35% Merlot, 5% Petit Verdot. Assemblage is 60% Cabernet Sauvignon, 30% Merlot, 10% Petit Verdot. The vineyard size is 22.5 hectares just for the red. Average vine age is 25 years. The soils are fast draining gravel, aging 12 months in 30 to 40% new French barrels, depending on the vintage. Production is 60,000 to 80,000 bottles, and the ABV is 13.5%. And with that, let's get into the wines. All right, so first, get the uh, Domaine Bousquet going. This, this wine has been out of the fridge for a while now, so it's definitely warmed up, which just means 
um, everything will come out. So let's check it out. Do, do, do. Super excited to try this. That lunch with Ann was fantastic. I really had a great time. It was cool to talk with about a whole bunch of stuff. Pop. Alrighty. Nice pop on that. Not intended to pop it, but it ended up being pop. Good bubbles. All good with that. All right. <clears throat> now the white Bordeaux. I'm super excited to try this. Being there's only 16 Grand Cru Class A, um, for Pesic Lignon. Um, it's really cool to try one of these. Uh, Chateau Carbono is probably one of the best known um, of the group, or at least one that I, I knew ahead of time. Uh, I've had the white. I've actually had a 1983 uh, of theirs. Uh, was never Was not really stored properly, but held up really well. Uh, it was very impressive. Maybe five, six years ago. They also make a red wine. I'm really excited to try this one. I mean, you got fancy neighbors on either side of you. Now, this one's not part of the Grand Cru Class A. Not sure why. I mean, proximity to Oprion, uh, Pepe Clement, uh, who are both in the Grand Cru Class A. Um, you know, a lot of times these classifications are like really political, unfortunately. So, especially Centimillion, you can read about that. You can search for it. I don't, I'm not putting a link down there. All right, so the. Um, Sparkling wine. It smells really nice. You can really smell the bubbles. You can smell the CO2. I get some nice yellow and green apple. Also get a touch of peach out of it. A little nectarine. <clears throat> and I am getting that kind of bakery brioche type of thing. I mean, it doesn't sit on leaves that long, but it's enough so you're going to get the bakery, a little bit of that bakery stuff, that pastry. It's almost actually like a, a, an apple fritter type of thing. Yeah, I'll just taste it. That's good. That's good. So it's got that really great mouthfeel. It's got that mousse, which is those, which is the bubbles, nice and tight. Um, so with champagne method or traditional method, you have a tendency to get the really tight bubbles, whereas the other methods, like the Charmat method, which I talk about in next week's episode, um, tend to be looser and bigger bubbles. So you, the champagne method gives you the tighter, smaller bubbles. So you get that really great mouthfeel, and this definitely has it. And you you, you get that kind of apple um, pastry type of thing going on. Mainly green apple on this. It's really kind of tart. Um, it's almost like getting one of those, those uh, green apple candies, those tart candies, and then you kind of somehow <clears throat> got the flavor of that and wrapped it inside of like a croissant or whatever. So you don't get, you don't get the crunchy because you know, those things are like hard to eat. We get the flavor of that. That's really cool. And you get a little bit of that peach going on there too. It's really tart. It is super delicious. I mean, this does really taste like, um, <clears throat> at least a, a normal traditional method non-vintage wine okay i'm not gonna necessarily say it tastes exactly like champagne because it's really hard to imitate champagne it's not just the method i talk about this next week's episode it's not just the method and the grapes you use but it's also the terroir you can get super close and this is really nice i've had some other ones that um i don't think are as nice um this is really nice especially at 18 dollars. i think this is a really good value you should check it out. All right, let's try the white uh, Bordeaux. I'm super excited to try this one. Ooh, man. 
aromatically, it's fantastic. So the other day, someone was asking me, they wanted like Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand that was grassy. I was like, well, you know, I don't really get grassy from Sauvignon Blanc all the time. But then the last couple of Sauvignon Blancs I've smelled and tasted, I'm like, I get grass. I'm like, well, wait a minute. So, you know, I think what it is with, with Sauvignon Blanc, I focus on other uh, aromas and flavors. So I focus on the fruit and I focus on the pepper, um, but I don't focus on the grassiness. So yeah, there's a bit of grassiness to this. Yeah, like a little bit of hay. Um, and I get some tropical fruit, a little papaya, guava, not so much pineapple. And I was expecting a lot more bell pepper or jalapeno. I don't really get it, which I'm, I'm kind of surprised, but at the same time I'm not. But I get like a green, like it smells like fern, like literally a fern or like I'm just like in a, in a forest or a, or a rainforest, which is like, you know, with just green plants, no flowers, just green plants, not trees necessarily. But yeah, there's a bit of savoriness to that. So that's probably the, 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 the chemical that creates uh, the bell pepper and the jalapeno aroma called pyrazine naturally occurs uh, in, the, in the fermentation. Sauvignon Blanc has elevated levels of it. So we tend to get it a lot from Sauvignon Blanc. But it's more of a green thing, arugula a little bit, like lettuce. But there's something else to it, almost a waxiness to it. It's probably the Simeon because Simeon can give you a little bit of waxiness to it. Man, I could just, I'm just tasting, I could smell this thing like all day. So it's like you, you got this guava, mango, pineapple-ish, touch of like ruby grapefruit um, salad going on. Um, and you threw some, I mean, for lack of a better description, hay into it, but also some like leafy green stuff that was a little bit bitter. Um, like, I mean, literally like you threw some burnt sage, a little sage in that thyme and like a dusting of like a, a bell pepper or jalapeno thing maybe like as the dressing and there's that you get this golden apple waxiness also to it like okay so i know what i'm gonna have for for my my christmas dinner and it was kind of a not quite a spoiler alert but i was i'd already decided what of uh, what wines from next week's episode is going to use for that but this may be the wine i drink with that with that uh dish and the sparkling wine this is so good i'm gonna have a veal dish and this will go great with the veal now the sparkling will go great with the veal because it's also a fried it's like a cutlet and the sparkling wine goes great with with fried food but this will be great with that it's also gonna be great with it would be great with salads with uh, just fruit it would be great with um, uh, any type of chicken dish, pork dish. Uh, it would be great with, um, uh, you could do seafood, absolutely seafood. You could probably do like, like shellfish. I would say shellfish with this. Maybe, maybe your, maybe more like your white fish, your flakier fish. I don't know if I'd necessarily go salmon. You probably go salmon with that. Yeah, you probably could do. I mean, it's, it's pretty versatile what you could do it with. Uh, you could do it with like margarita pizzas. You could do it with Hawaiian pizza. Um, you could do that. Um, yeah, ham kind of, it might overpower. Well, if it was like a honeyed ham, because the waxiness from the semion is a bit of, there's probably a touch of botrytis happening there. Um, you know what it is? What else? There's, there's a little bit. So semion can also produce a thing called petrol, which we, we find in Riesling. Like Riesling has all this petrol type of thing, right? Rubber, tire, gas, gasoline, oil type plastic. There's a touch of that in here. And, and I know that Semyon can do that and I don't experience it very often, but yeah, um, it's pretty versatile one, but it's, it's on that tart side. It's super delicious. Wow. It's 35 bucks. Yeah, it's worth it. All right. The red wine. Let's just get into it. Hey, you know what? 
I've been meaning to say this. I, I, I subscribe to a lot of channels and I've been noticing that it's it's these hosts, these the YouTubers, at the beginning of their video, they'll give you an introduction. So let's get into it. And I'm like, what do we get into? Anyway, I just used it for the wine. It's legit. So you got um, blackberry, you got some raspberry, you got some vanilla. Now, yeah, it was 30 to 40% new. Yeah, more cab than, than anything else. Like it smells like a cab, more cab blend for sure. I get a touch of blueberry. I get a little touch of funk. Um, it is Bordeaux. Um, as a good friend of mine says, if it smells like poop, it's French. It's not super poopy, but there's there's a touch of that uh, funkiness going on. A little earthiness. Mushroom quality. Uh, the, the, the slightest touch of barnyard, which is not uncommon in Bordeaux. Yeah. It smells a little bit alcoholy, a little boozy. Only 13.5, so it may be just the aroma. I'm picking up on. I've been coughing a lot lately, so I'm, what you saw me do that probably cut all that out so it didn't blow your ears. A little leather, tar, sage. Yeah. Bramble. Man. A little cinnamon, a little clove. Not a ton. It was more the vanilla I was getting from the oak. I cannot wait to try this. It's delicious. It's definitely a forty-five dollar bottle of wine, forty-five U.S. Now let's be real. In Bordeaux, this is probably like a twenty-five euro wine, okay. But it's it's definitely a well-made wine. Maybe I looked it up to see what what they sell it for in Europe. So what I like about it, so you have like have that freshly polished wood, a little pledge going on there. Not let's say lemon pledge, but you can smell like that that polish going on with the wood. Um, but it smells like old wood, right? It doesn't smell like brand new. It smells, it smells like you walked into an antique shop and they kind of polished the, they, they polished the wooden furniture, but you get that rusticity to it. You get a little bit of cinnamon. The clove is there. The vanilla is much more reduced, but there is a bit of that creaminess to it. Um, you get the, I mean, blackberry for days on this. Uh, black raspberry, a little raspberry too. Um, you get that uh, bramble or that um, vegetal thing going on. Sage, uh, fern. So Cabernet Sauvignon um, and Merlot, but more Cabernet Sauvignon can have that pyrazine quality too. I mean, Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc got busy in the vineyard and produced Cabernet Sauvignon. It's absolutely in the name. Um, and so Cabernet Sauvignon tends to have a good amount of pyrazine or can. It's very, very slight here. It's starting to become less and less prominent in especially uh, the, uh, Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon, even from the old world. It just smells and tastes pretty. Um, there's a bit of flower to it, so we can give that. A little bit of red flower rose petal to it. There's a bitterness to it too. There is a bit of coffee to it. I'm not a fan of coffee, but in the wine, I'm usually okay with it. But yeah, I kind of like kind of that really roasted, almost espresso type thing going on. Yeah, I think it's a really good wine. I'm super impressed with it. I'm impressed with the whole lineup. I think every wine is fantastic, especially with the price point you're paying. I think it's fantastic for 18 bucks. I think it's absolutely worth 35, and it's absolutely worth 45 in, in, in the US market. I think they're wonderful wines. All right, that's gonna do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe, and then tell your friends, and we'll see you next time. Maybe with some Argentine bubbles, or some Bordeaux. Cheers.